Hi, I'm Brent Mischler from UC Berkeley. I'd like to thank Nico and Michael for asking me to join in this interesting and perhaps controversial uh, colloquium. Here's an outline of my talk, which will have three parts. First, I'm going to go into how we could name clades at the formal level of species. And I'm going to argue that species uh, shouldn't be treated any differently than any other rank, and they should be simply clades named with a rankless uninomial. And the smallest of these are going to be what are called uh, snarks, which I'll explain later. Then I'll give an example from mosses to show how this would work. And then I will proceed to show how we could do biodiversity analyses and conservation without having species or ranks, which uh, some people uh, feel is not possible, but is quite possible and actually can be done better. I'm basically arguing for a return to Darwin's novel view of species, which was remarkably rank-free. One of his most important and novel contribution to biology was this recognition that the species level is just an arbitrary point in the divergent, uh, divergence of two lineages. The origin of species is full of passages indicating this view that the species rank is arbitrary, even though the lineages are quite real. His view was that divergence between two lineages happens, and at some point it's convenient to call the two lineages species, according to the judgment of a competent taxonomist, but nothing particular, particularly special or universal or magic has occurred at that point. It's all about uh, the divergence and what's driving it. Unfortunately, the Darwin's novel view was obscured by the modern synthesis in the middle part of the 20th century, with the rise of the biological species concept, which is still widely accepted today, but has many problems. In restricted locations, it might be possible to tell which groups are interbreeding with which. However, when you compare groups across uh, different areas, different regions on the map, or groups known from fossils, it's impossible to know whether interbreeding would occur. Sometimes interbreeding occurs between very distant relatives, well above what anybody would want to call the species level. On the other hand, uh, sometimes no interbreeding occurs between very close relatives, as in asexual groups. The ability to interbreed often just diminishes gradually as more distant relatives are considered, so the biological species does not give a unique cutoff. And many groups that can interbreed, and maybe even do interbreed, are not monophyletic groups, and so phylogeneticists have not been able to have much use for them. So for all these reasons, the biological species concept needs to be abandoned and replaced with a phylogenetic concept. As detailed in other talks in this colloquium, the ranks in the Linnaean system are problematic for classification in many ways, just a few of which are there aren't nearly enough ranks to suffice in classifying the whole tree of life with its millions of branches. The need to maintain the hierarchy of the ranks leads to instability. Rank classifications, maybe most tellingly, can lead to bad science if a user of a classification naively, but perhaps understandably, assumes that tax at the same rank are comparable in some way. These are general uh, views held by everybody that supports the phyla code. However, interestingly, only some supporters of the phyla code will acknowledge that all these arguments apply to species equally to uh, genera, families, or any other rank. So how could you apply rank-free classification to terminal taxa, the level formerly known as species? Well, they can be applied exactly as the, at the more inclusive levels. Just treat the names as rank-free uninomials. Treat the specimens, the specifiers, as actual specimens rather than uh, any taxa. Don't necessarily need to be Linnaean types. The terminal most clades named in this way would be the snarks. We call them the smallest named and registered clades, which are not meant to be a rank, just a pragmatic cutoff based on current data. One would name the tree down to the level at which your data allows. Then if future sampling and analysis discovers smaller clades nested inside of what was considered to be a snark, it retains its name. And the newly named clades are now the snarks in this same pragmatic way for the time being. I want to give a, an example from mosses that was actually published quite a 
while ago as uh, how to apply rankless names to the level that's formally known as species. This slide shows the larger context. This is within what is sometimes ranked as a family, Climperaceae, or can't just be called the clade Climperaceae. And highlighted in blue there is Leucophenella, which is one of the subclades. And the next slide shows Leucophenella uh, expanded with actual exemplars shown as the terminals. And within Leucophenella, as this was named by Kirsten Fisher, there were recognized three snarks. One is Revolutus, which happens to correspond to what had been called Sauropodon Revolutus in the past. So here's what a taxonomic treatment would look like of these. On the left-hand side is a traditional botanical code classification with some synonyms in there. On the right-hand side is the way the name would be defined in file code style. This would be a node-based definition. And there are four specifiers, two of which are Linnaean types for species, two of which are not. But we're using the specimens here. Importantly note, we're using the specimens and not the species names as the specifiers. These recommendations I'm making actually don't follow the current version of the file code, which illogically still treats species approximating clades differently than clades at other levels, thus retaining one rank in an otherwise rankless system. Here is a couple of sections out of the file code where species names and the species level are singled out for special treatment, indicating that the species is still a rank in this rank-free code. And it allows, um, as a further problem, it allows uh, much confusion if you use a species name rather than its type specimen to be the specifier. It really should be the specimen, and it, that might be the type of a species name, but it should be the specimen. So the species rank really needs to be removed completely and entirely from the file code before it can be logically consistent and free itself from the current rank-based codes. So to change gears and get into the third section of the talk, what I'd like to talk about is what many of us are concerned with these days, is how we do conservation or even plain old academic biodiversity analyses without species or other ranks. Some think that there's just no way to do conservation without species, and this is just not the case. You can do it really well without species. In fact, if you forget about the ranks, you can do it even better than by just using taxon counts. We just measure diversity and endemism directly using the phylogeny. The traditional metrics to assess diversity in an area were species-based, how many species are present, and weighted endemism, how big are their ranges. But instead of that, much better metrics are phylogenetic diversity and phylogenetic endemism, which is a PD measure, but each branch divided by its range size. So it's a weighted PD by range size. And the two trees there show how PD could be quite different, even with the same number of terminals. Both of the two trees have 14 terminals, but in one case on the left, they're closely related ones. And in the case on the right, they're very distantly related ones. So the one on the right has much more phylogenetic diversity for the 14 tips than the one on the left. And that's important for both academics and uh, for conservation. This field of spatial phylogenetics, which is a relatively recently developed field enabled by large phylogenetic trees and spatial data being generated uh, in part through the ADBC program and other efforts around the world to get museum data uh, digitized, Spatial phylogenetic space <coughs> basically places the tree of life on the map as a GIS layer. And then you're able to use the phylogenetic information uh, directly with other information to assess uh, ecology or biogeography or uh, conservation. And this is uh, really, uh, it's rank-free and it's robust to splitting and lumping decisions 
because what matters are the branch lengths, not what rank the branches are uh, placed at. There have been spatial phylogenetic studies now using this approach all around the world, and here are just some figures from a few of them, and it has proven uh, quite feasible to do biodiversity assessment and uh, conservation evaluation in this way. The most promising way to actually do conservation evaluation using the phylogenies is illustrated by this paper by Kling et al, which uses a, an algorithm to iteratively evaluate areas for their conservation importance using a principle of complementarity where you're considering how the tree is conserved across the whole map when you're making a decision on what's the next place to conserve. And we realized that there's several different metrics that one can use to uh, look at the evolutionary dimension of biodiversity. And there are we, at least three important ones that we show here, uh, measuring PD on phylograms or on chronograms or on uh, old-fashioned cladograms where all the branches are equal give you different information and important information about processes uh, that have occurred to give you the biodiversity that you have on the landscape. And I think there's a lot of promise to this to extending to uh, many other parts of the world. To close, I want to put in a shameless plug for a new book on this topic which is called What If Anything Our Species Thanks to a grant from my university library, it's available in open access, and the link is in the Botany 2021 abstract. Thank you very much for listening, and I'd be glad to take questions or comments.